We're all sitting in the same room, but each of us is in a different world. What the Buddha calls becoming. The room here is our becoming on the human plane. We all have a share in that. But our perspective on that plane is something very individual. We've each taken on a role as a being in this realm. And we see the world through our own eyes, not through anybody else's. We feel it through our own body and not through anybody else's. Though it is true that we have certain patterns in common, otherwise there'd be no point in talking, no, no point in sharing knowledge. This is why the Buddha said that his four noble truths are noble. They're universal. They apply to everybody. The structure of how each of us creates suffering is the same. Now, some of the details will be different, but the main structure in terms of the fact that the suffering is in the clinging, and the clinging comes from craving, the kind of craving that leads to more becoming. That craving can be ended by following the path. That's a pattern we all have in common, and that's where we can learn how to be right. We don't start out right. We start out with our ignorance, and we're learning about the Four Noble Truths and the duties that are appropriate to them. But we're not going to really know them until we've completed the duties. We'll have a sense of what's right and what's wrong. But even for those who gain the Dharma, in other words, those who gain stream entry, there's still certain things they don't understand about the the duties. They've got the basic framework down, and they have the, an idea of what's going to be on course and what's off course. But the details that will take them all the way, those are things they still have to learn. And those are noble disciples. So for those of us who are not noble disciples, we have to accept the fact that we're still learning about what's right. And Paul Poot, who was a student of Ajahn Sao, one of Ajahn Sao's few students, tells us the time when he was a novice attending to Ajahn Sao. People would come and ask to learn how to meditate, and he'd tell them to repeat Bhutto. And they would ask him, what does Bhutto mean? He said, don't ask, just do it. And what's going to happen when I do it? Don't ask, just do it. So some of them would go and do it, and they'd come back and they'd report the results. And if the results were definitely wrong, he said, okay, you're doing this wrong. You've got to change the way you're doing it. And he would give them advice. And if they're doing it right, then ask, is this right? And he said, whether it's, whether it's right or not, just keep on doing it. Because it's really right only when the mind really settles down. And if you're talking about ultimate right, it's really right only when you take it all the way to awakening. So you're on the way to what's right. And you have to accept that, that and you have to learn how to compensate for it. This is why we have to keep checking our knowledge again and again. And this is just dealing with things inside ourselves. Dealing with people outside is even more complicated. You have five aggregates. Each other person has his or her five aggregates. And when we get into contact with another, it's not like adding them. It's like multiplying them. We're five to the fifth power. A lot of complications. So you have to realize when you're dealing with other people, the same issues that apply inside are going to apply outside. Even more so, okay, you're coming from wrong and you're trying to learn what's right. And so there are bound to be mistakes, and you have to learn how to live with the mistakes and learn from them. This is how the, why the Buddha gave that lesson to Rahula at the very beginning. It wasn't about how to do things right all the time. It's basically instructions in how to try to do things as best you can. Always try to work on good intentions. If you have any intentions that you know are unskillful, don't follow them. If they seem skillful, go ahead. But you're going to find out sometimes that 
a skillful intention leads you to do something that's not skillful, or what seems to be a skillful intention. Let's put it this way, it's a good intention. It can lead to bad results, which means you have to go back and look at the intention and look at what you did and see how best you can learn from it. It's, this is easiest to do when you act on what you think are good intentions. If you know the intention is bad, and you come out with bad results, you tend to hide it from yourself. So first lesson, try to act on what is your best intention. But realize that there are things to learn. If you have that attitude, you're here to learn. Then you're approaching the meditation with the right attitude. So on the days when the meditation goes well, notice that. And after the meditation is over, try to reflect back. Okay, where were you focused? What was the breath like? And there seems to be a point where things were especially solid and clear inside. What were the steps leading up to that? Can you remember? And if you're mindful enough, you should have some memory. Try to apply that the next time around. Now the next time around, it may not work. Which means you have to realize that the mind has its moods, it has its rhythms. And what worked yesterday may not work today. Or it may be the fact that you didn't observe things carefully. You made a mistake. Learn how to be cheerful about your mistakes. In other words, admit their mistakes and be serious about not following them through. But then just accept the fact that you're wrong. You can be wrong. So many times people ask, how can I guarantee that I don't do anything wrong? But there's no guarantee ahead of time. The best thing is to develop the attitude, I'm here to learn. If things don't go well in the meditation, again, you're here to learn. Why are they not going well? Is it the breath? Is it what's going on in the mind? Is it the state of mind you're bringing to the meditation? And what are the things that you can manipulate and change to see how, if you can get better results? And even if you don't get better results, remind yourself, okay, you learned. That didn't work. This didn't work. Next time around, see what else you can try. And always be alive to the fact that you may be asking the wrong questions. I'm reading a book now on sort of the history of humanity going back to the earliest stages. And the authors are pointing out that many of the questions that anthropologists and archaeologists have been asking all along have been the wrong questions. If you learn to ask new questions, you can see the data and you see the things that people missed because they were funneled into the wrong questions, and the questions funneled their attention in the wrong places. So the question about how can I deal with people, how can I not hurt their feelings? Well, remember, we are not to harm them. Hurt feelings are not harm. Saying things that hurt people's feelings is not wrong speech. The Buddha said there's a time and place for speech that is unpleasant, as long as you're motivated by what you see as true. And it seems to be beneficial. Okay, you're acting on good intentions. Then you've got to figure out what's the right time to say things that are pleasing, and what, what's the right time and way to say things in a displeasing way. Realizing that being displeasing is not automatically harm. And you're going to learn. And you're going to learn that you make mistakes sometimes. And if you want to be the kind of person who doesn't make mistakes at all, you have to go hide out someplace and be alone, not contact people at all. There will always be errors. Even our hunts can make mistakes in their dealings with other people. There's that biography that John Mahabur wrote about Ajahn Man, and he happened to meet up with one of Ajahn Man's students who had had a lot of psychic issues coming up in his meditation. When that student had brought his problems to John Munn, and John Munn would tell him about the problems he had of that sort. Now these were things that John Munn ordinarily would not talk about. 
as he had told John Fung, when you have things like this happen in your meditation, you tell only one person, i.e. the teacher. It's not anybody else's business. Apparently John Fung had been checking out the devas in the nearest hills. I had mentioned something about this to some of the other monks. And then John Mun reprimanded him quite strongly. Where's this other monk? Years after John Mun had passed away, was interviewed by a John Mahabu, and he told all the various things he learned about in John Mun's visions of devas here and Nagas there and whatnot. So John Mahabu put that into the biography of John Mun. And then when it was printed, there was a huge reaction, a very negative reaction in a lot of circles. And John Mun, excuse me, John Mahabur realized that those were things he should not have put in the book. So in dealing with other people, it's possible to have purest mind, and you can still make mistakes. But if you have the right attitude, you learn from them. Of course, a pure mind will learn from them. Our minds are not fully pure yet. But if we have the attitude, I'm here to learn, that will see you through a lot of things. And I said a lot of learning is learning that you've been asking the wrong questions. Or you may have picked up a view that's not quite right. When you're dealing with your own issues inside, the gold standard, of course, is the Four Noble Truths and the duties appropriate to them. When you're dealing with people outside, you have to remember what counts as harm and what doesn't count as harm. If you induce people to have greed, aversion, and delusion on purpose, okay, that's harm. If you induce them to break the precepts, that's harm. And if you hurt their feelings, sometimes it's skillful and sometimes it's not. So learn how to make distinctions like this. Learn how to develop the quality that the Buddha calls patipana. It's a word that's hard to translate. It can be translated as ingenuity. It's your inner resourcefulness, your ability to think outside the box. So when you run into an issue with other people, Ask yourself, okay, what other ways can I look at this? How can I handle the situation, at the very least, not causing harm? And at the best, maintaining harmony, maintaining a sense of community, maintaining an ability to work together for a positive purpose. Knowing that there are some situations where you have to develop equanimity. You start out with goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy. But there will be cases where you have to develop equanimity as well. You don't go straight to the equanimity, you maintain the goodwill. But there are times when you have to fall back on equanimity. So you're here to learn. And you can maintain that attitude. It helps you deal skillfully with a lot of mistakes, so you can learn the lessons that they have to teach. And as I say, approach this with a certain amount of cheerfulness. Happy that you can learn. Happy that your mind is not so set in its ways. That it's closed to learning things new. If you can maintain that attitude, it will see you through a lot of problems and help keep you on course.